My name is Paul DeCrane. I am the Global Treasury Service Leader, uh, Practice Leader at Ernst & Young. I'm happy to have you here for our session on U.S. Tax Regulation Section 385. I, I know this is tied to the concerns on uh, notional pooling as well as physical pooling, so I'm happy to be a part of our Treasury Talks update and give you a snapshot understanding of where we stand on Section 385 uh, within the U.S., how it impacts both domestic and foreign institutions, how it impacts the overall funding uh, strategies going forward, and what companies should start thinking about as far as uh, taking a look at their treasury operations in light of the tax regulation. First, I'd like to start off just giving you a little background on uh, on 385 as well as uh, the timing on the regulation and when it may take place. Um, on October, on, or, excuse me, on April 4th, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, in response to anti-inversion efforts within the U.S., uh, released Section, 85, three, Section 385, which is a proposal to make law uh, regulations that's been in place since uh, 1965. The regulation has not become law. It's anticipated to come law with, within the next two months before the next presidential uh, uh, inductee will take office in January in January or in January of uh, 2018. Uh, there are three major impacts or effects that are uh, viewed from coming out of this uh, IRS rule. One is IRS is looking to bifurcate. Uh, debt from uh, equity as it's portrayed or passed through intercompany loans. Uh, there's a heightened doc documentation requirement related to intercompany loans that will inspect and help identify uh, debt that's passed in lieu of equity uh, under these circumstances. Uh, and then there's also some technical uh, constraints around debt instruments issued with certain related parties it's part of the subchapter C recharacter recharacterization of equity. The timing of this of this law is is in full force right now. It's entered its final review, which is uh, the extension of the law and the bill uh, that has been passed to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House. So we're expecting within the next 40 to 60 days this could become law. Generally, uh, generally, uh, once this becomes law, it's not determined yet whether or not uh, the retrospective impact of looking back to April 4th will actually be applied or whether there'll be a forgiveness or a come into compliance period. It's expected that there will be a come into compliance period, but uh, those revisions are under review by the, by the I OIRA right now. So who may be affected? Uh, both inbound and outbound companies, foreign entities with debts back to the U.S. as well as U.S. entities with subsidiaries overseas will be impacted uh, with, uh, as long as they have the debt instruments or debt relationships between the related parties. Uh, there, within the regulations, there's new and expansive uh, inclusions that also uh, looked to tax exempt entities as well as controlled partnerships, which previously hasn't been contemplated by the regulation. Uh, the possible consequences coming out of this regulation enforcement is loss of interest deductions, which could be substantial in some cases. Uh, more substantially, withholding tax and dividend payments relative to reclassification of debt to equity, uh, and it, unintended movements of earnings and profits that result from uh, the proposed or the subsequent underlying uh, instruments, and we'll go over those different instruments types in a few minutes. Uh, split equity ownership, so if there's joint ventures and an intercompany loans funding a good portion of that joint venture, you may be subject to uh, uh, equity, uh, per se equity, which will trigger a tax withholding 
uh, requirement, which could be on a hundred million dollar loan, could be up to, you know, 20 million in some cases. So, very substantial impacts there, uh, and it can create new classes of, of of stock, which can become problematic when you're thinking about your accounting and losses uh, related to disregarded entities. Uh, when I like to take a step back when we think of the regulation and when you're a treasurer, you, you, think, you think of instruments and funding vehicles. So there's six primarily funding or transaction types or funding vehicles that you normally view as being impacted. Uh, your more traditional intercompany loans, which is the ter term and demand debt, where you have fixed term rate uh, uh, extended debt for repayment duration to your subsidiary or among subsidiaries. Open account is where the debt, where the principal uh, flows can flip from entity to entity as there's an open relationship on that account. Debt facility, which is the revolving component. Uh, trade payables is also included. This is something new that folks have not uh, previously considered, which you know relates to intercompany credit extended to subsidiaries, you know, for goods and services consumed on a normal basis. Uh, cash sweeps. Uh, cash sweeps can be extremely problematic when you think of the documentation requirement be behind 385, and we'll get to that in a couple minutes here. Uh, and then cash pools. Cash pools, uh, we'll dig into that in a little more detail. There's physical and notional. Uh, there's expected to be an impact on both, and I'll touch on both. So the, the easier pooling arrangement to discuss is, is physical pools because there's, definitive, uh, there's a definitive relationship in many cases and there's a borrowing, uh, there's an, a borrowing agreement that's backed. Uh, the tax requirement requires these loans to be documented and agreed upon in legal form between two counterparties or related parties within an organization and it's got to be a lot binding loan agreement, complete with credit underwriting and terms and conditions that are re representative of the market, as well as an ongoing monitoring of that loan agreement in whatever form it may be, uh, to evaluate the default status of that loan. And at any point, if it becomes default, if it goes into default, then it needs to be considered uh, uh, an equity relationship or some form of repayment has to take place. And that, that, that relates to the per se stock implement, implement implications that come out of default. Uh, the holding company in, in these cases is the agent for the group, so therefore they're the loan provider and they're in charge of administering all the requirements as far as regular maintenance of the loan and providing the documentation required to the IRS in order to get the interest deduction and in order to um, to maintain the debt status and not the per se conversion or recharacterization of equity. ZBAs are not included uh, as part of uh, the physical pools as long as they are truly zero balance accounts. The treasury impact on physical pooling is that Binding loan agreements have to be established, so there has to be an infrastructure for managing, tracking, and actually signage, if you will, of, of the loan agreements. There has to be a loan officer on each side, so there's, so there's some real process impl implications behind 385, these intercompany loans. Uh, there has to be an initial credit evaluation. The credit evaluation can be a phantom credit evaluation based on an internal credit rating uh, process or methodology, uh, not as in-depth as a banking institution, but in-depth enough to prove that the subsidiary has the appropriate level of, of funding and cash flow to repay the loan on a regular basis. Uh, the, mar the, the loan's got to be a market convention. convention. There's got to be payment tracking throughout the course of the loan. This has to be documented, and in many cases, a lot of organizations do not have inventory of all their intercompany loans, nor do they have the technology necessary to track regular payments to show that the, the loan is not in default. 
Uh, there's also possible collateral collateral implications if the loan does go into default as defined within the, the credit requirements of the statute. Now, a little bit more abstract is the implications on notional pools. As many of us know, uh, notional pools have been under attack by Basel III. Uh, the capital implications uh, that will be applied on the leverage ratio of the banks will in turn make notional pools more expensive going forward, or at least it's expected to. It's my full expectation that it will. But layered on to that, there's the, this question around 3D5 and the impact on how it will handle these loans uh, going forward uh, from a tax code perspective. Now, as we all know, with notional pools, there's really no interest expense or, in, or interest income relative to the pool, by and large, in many arrangements. And therefore, th that raises the question as to whether they will fall subject to 385 restrictions. Uh, the, the regulation, as stated, does not distinguish between physical and notional loans, or notional pools. Uh, and the requirements are not specific or, or explicit related to notional pools. The interpretation, though, is clear around IRS IRS statement that applicable instruments that are not indebtedness that are not indebtedness form could imply notional pools as a subject to the documentation requirement as well as the underwriting requirement that we discuss for physical pools. This is the main question. Uh, the question uh, explicitly is being approached uh, with the IRS and with the federal government and. Uh, we do expect to get clarifi further clarification within the next 30 to 60 days on how it will directly impact uh, notional loans, notional pools. Uh, what there is, uh, and related to uh, the question of scrutiny, is if there is scrutiny around the use and, and the overall structure of the pools and how they're being handled, and then if it is viewed that there's that being moved in lieu of equity related to the pool, the whole pool becomes under scrutiny and it's, it's, it's the, the volume of the pool and the cascading effect of all the institutions and participants in the pool that could be impacted. So that's, that's the big whammy, if you will, as far as, uh, as, far as risk and as far as not understanding uh, how this can be applied. Uh, where there's interest optimization, uh, which means there's uh, there's accounts where the bank pays interest to the pool adder. Those are excluded from the overall uh, notional pool uh, consideration. So what's the tre impact to Treasury? I think what the treasurers need to start thinking about is more transparent intercompany loan agreements, uh, defining the in individual agreements on a terms and conditions basis, being able to represent some of the key aspects that I just mentioned for physical pools and be able to demonstrate the direct lending relationships from entity to entity and from entity to the pool. Pooling agreements may also need to be modified to reflect arm's length nature where those terms and conditions aren't arm's length and don't reflect the market convention. And new funding strategies may need to be considered if uh, notional pooling uh, does become subject to 385 interpretation. I figured I'd end just with an overall uh, illustration of financial impact because, you know, all this regulatory hype never really hits home until you understand what the, what the value impact could be uh, with an illustrative example. So in this scenario, we have company XYZ, uh, which has a loan pool that does not meet docu documentation requirements hypothetically and prospectively and comes under IRS scrutiny. Now, as you mentioned, there's the three-year look back. So when we consider a five-year loan, I'll, I'll, look, I'll consider the two years forward and the three-year look back on the loan. On a $100 million loan with a market rate of 5% a year, a five-year loan at 5%, the interest expense would be $25 million in aggregate, hypothetically, over the life of the borrowing. And the U.S. group tax rate is 35%. Uh, 
the loss relative to the interest obligation that would normally be written down is $8.75 million. And that's, uh, that would be a cash impact due to the loss of the interest deduction. It would be a cash liability to the, the federal government of the U.S. This does not w consider withholding requirements, which would be more punitive, which would be in the 35 percent range on the notional value of the loan. And the result of that would be an additional $15 million of withholding tax that could be applied. Uh, if, if you hold hundreds of millions of dollars of intercompany loans, it's in everyone's best interest to examine those loans, look at the documentation requirement, evaluate your capability to manage and monitor those loans according to the reporting requirements of the, the, the U.S. federal government so that you're not caught by surprise with tax liabilities going forward.